the people moved from this kind of area had no money for security guards and the buildings they moved into were so impersonal they needed more guards, not none. Some thought if tower blocks looked better, they'd work better. In France, the architect Le Corbusier started a whole movement by relating the proportions of his buildings to the human figure, evolving modular design where dimensions were tailor-made for a new concept of practical but aesthetically satisfying architecture. To increase the sense of space around his buildings and stop them becoming visual barricades, he built them on huge pillars. This one near Marseilles has become almost a shrine where architects come to do homage to his memory. Its design was to be the model for thousands of similar projects all around the world. The Americans were not to be outdone. In St. Louis, Missouri, they have the biggest triumphal arch on earth to celebrate their being the gateway to the west. To rehouse their slums, they commissioned the finest architects and these models illustrate the prize-winning design. It was built following all the latest concerns, all the most up-to-date philosophies of the architectural profession. The architect followed the dictates of the International Congress of Modern Architecture, the plans of Le Corbusier's and ideas. He took the population and put them in 11 and 12 story buildings uh, when he had other options, intentionally to free a lot of ground space for children to play in. What he saw was a river of trees. That's how he wrote about it. He designed the interior of the buildings as well for sun to come in. Huge corridors was his vision. Children playing there, mothers tending to uh, clothes and a variety of other things. It was a beautiful image, a new image, an image of how people should live, a new alternative for living in cities. Put the people up, give them a view. The view happens to be the other buildings, but give them a view. Uh, give them space down below, free the grounds. It was a great image. And uh, of course he was received and welcomed by the architectural profession. He got every single award in the year. Almost from the start, the building began to be vandalized and began to be crime-ridden. And this went on and became acutely worse. As people refused to move in, gangs began to move in and occupy the apartments and use the apartments as a base of operation to victimize the rest of the population. The play spaces on the ground were too distant for the mothers to allow their children down to. They became sewers of glass and garbage rather than rivers of trees. They've become, the insides of the building, the interior spaces were vandalized, the heating equipment torn apart, garbage strewn everywhere, lights smashed, windows broken, and not isolated instances, but uniformly across the entire project. The net result of all this quality design was in fact the production of an environment of fear. He could have built a project which would have simply blended into the rest of the city. He could have built low-income housing, as Pruitt Igo is, so it was virtually indistinguishable from the surrounding middle-class housing. But instead, he wanted to build something that would be prominent, something that would be new, something that would stand out, that would capture the attention. Uh, Pruitt Igo dominates the St. Louis landscape. High-rise buildings can be seen everywhere, and the project stands out. But for the rest of the population, for the people who live in it, just as the people who live around it, it stands out as a sore. It's a stigma. It was really a beautiful place. It was really beautiful down here. It was clean. People had pride then. I don't... I don't know uh, what happened to that pride. I don't know that over the years that pride just, uh, they, they just got tired. Lord Igo had some vacancies in it almost from the first day. And it climbed from 50% vacancy rate to 85% vacancy rate in recent years. The project, of course, is not economically viable and never was. Some people cared and it was enough that they cared and couldn't do anything about, about the way that the buildings had deteriorated. And then the federal government decided that uh, maybe we didn't care enough.
They tried to remove several floors of Pruitt Igo using high explosive. It was not a success. Oscar Newman reports on the situation today. The current Secretary of Housing has decided that Pruitt Igo was in fact a disastrous mistake and that it was foolish from his point of view for the government to adopt a policy of trying to salvage these things. Better admit to the error and simply tear the entire thing down. This is the Aylesbury estate in London. We invited Oscar Newman to England to see if we're making similar mistakes to those he's researched in America, mistakes that relate closely to explosions in crime. When you see Aylesbury estate from the surrounding streets, it's almost as if creatures from another world have come down and build their own environment. It's that foreign. The important thing, though, is that Aylesbury estate has cut off the surrounding streets from itself isolate itself with walls on all sides. Kids still play football amongst the cars. They're not supposed to. They're supposed to use the elevated walkways to go to play areas, sometimes half a mile from home. On walkways, you're safe from traffic, but Newman questions if this is really the right approach to home sweet home. This delightful area faces due north and never receives any sun. Far worse than that, there are no windows from the dwelling unit that look out onto the space. A mother of a young child can't really be asked to allow the child to play out here when she can't see it. There isn't even a window in the door of the unit so that the child can play immediately out the door with any degree of safety. Children are put out to play and they can no longer be seen by their mothers and fathers. Uh, this also doesn't help neighbours in becoming neighbours with one another. The, uh, the, the, the pattern of living is not designed that way at all. And it, it, it tends to uh, develop a sort of isolation uh, in the minds of many mothers and many families. Walking along these walkaways in the evenings late, you know, you get quite nervous actually. There's so many nooks and crannies in these places where you know, anyone could be. I think people prefer to be in the street, you know, where they can see street doors and things when they walk along, they feel more safer. To be quite honest, my Lippman drove me mad when I first looked at him. <coughs> because he couldn't get down. He still can't get down unless uh, one of my other children take him down, unless I take him down. Um, he doesn't like the lifts. Um, I don't like him using the staircase because it's, it's at the back of the flats. Um, you never know who's on the stairs. There have been a couple of incidents of uh, men being on the stairs. And um, I just don't like them using the stairs at all. There's nowhere for the kids to play. If they play on the grass, they've got to get off. And the council said they're not allowed to play on the grass. So I said, well, give them somewhere to play. And they've got to say that. They put the elderly people, such as me, with children. That's been ridiculous. I've had my share of kids years ago. Yeah, well, I think that they, um, they ought to separate the old people from the, the mixed families, you know, where there's big families, because they get no privacy here, you know. And they get all the annoyance. 
Yes, yeah, so you've got three flats close together there, ain't you? You can hear everything anyone says, can't you? Yeah. No privacy here at all. The front room's downstairs, you know, and then two bedrooms right here. And everyone's walking on your head as you're trying to have a sleep when they come out the pubs. What, what about uh, the general uh, look of the place, do you like that? Oh, well, look at it for yourself, look. And it's like prison, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it, like? <laughs> hey, look. All concrete, isn't it? Concrete jungle, as we all call it. No, I mean, they're very depressing places. But the rent you pay, well, you know, and they, what they're doing to it makes it look horrible. You know, you say to people, when well, you live on the Elms, they look to say, you know, just to say, oh, that, that place. In America, Newman's proved a direct relationship between vandalism and crime. In Britain, we already now have the vandalism. It remains to be seen whether our new architectural legacy will bring us the violence, the muggings, the murder and rape. Many turn a blind eye on graffiti, but we ignore it at our peril. It protests against the new architectural style which makes housing so big and tall. Part of the reason it looks and becomes this big monolith is we've had to raise the entire building off the ground raise it to provide places for the automobile. And the pedestrian ways we saw up in the air as well, they add to the height. But when you take a look at these wonderful garages, take a look at the space provided for the automobile under the buildings, we find that the people don't use them. We find that the, it's simply, if you park your car here, it'll be vandalized at night. There's no point in it, and people end up putting their car on the street where it can be seen. If you put your car in a garage underneath there, you, you, they get nicked, it gets pilfered yeah. and all. It's, it's safe, but so, yeah, so, so you can watch it. You can watch it, you've got to watch it all the time, you? Terrible, man, you've got to watch it all the time. Even tell you a little noise, you're up at the window, see if you can open up your car around here. It's terrible. Some think it's terrible, but many are grateful for their new homes. Southwark has a very much better housing record than many other London boroughs. Well, I brought three children up in two rooms, and they were well old fans. My father lived downstairs. But when he died, they said, take the house over. I wasn't in it two years, and they put me round here. Well, it's seven. Having a bathroom, having water, and they're up and downstairs with slop pails and water. Kiddies can have a bath when they want it. But it's come too late, because they're getting married now. <laughs> <laughs> the architect don't live here. That's the reason here. He wanted to come and live here for a week. See his mistakes, but he won't. Few architects ever live in the end product of their sketched utopias, their visual echoes of Venetian piazzas. This is how one such dream turned out in real life. In bricks, mortar and concrete in London is the Caledonian Market Estate. Like a good deal of the, our projects in America, the architects of the Caledonian Market Estate were motivated in their design to create as much open space as possible. The buildings on the left here were raised off the ground to provide a continuous expanse of space through the project. The plaza area was freed of any building and then the entire project was developed as a series of high-rise blocks to free as much ground and green area as possible. But the entire thing is really quite unworkable. Children are not, in fact, allowed to play down here, and the estate management insists that both the plaza area and the abundant green space not be used for children's play. Children must keep off the grass. They're not supposed to play on the walkways. They do both. This lawn is only a few hundred yards from an adventure playground, but many kids won't go there. It's too far away, so they play here, close to home. But is this kind of housing our only option if we must live cheek by jowl in cities? Strangely enough, it's not, and bang next door to this project, almost the same number of people are housed on a similar acreage in a compact, low-rise estate where most families not only live near the ground, but even have their own garden, however small. 
It comprises flats and maisonettes built on a human scale where people know their neighbours and don't get lost in the anonymous impersonality of big housing blocks. In San Francisco, there's a public housing project built before pruitt Igo in St. Louis and at almost the same density per acre. It's not much to look at, but it works. It's the home of very similar families to pruitt Igo, but they live around courtyards, half of which serve as parking lots for the cars and half as play spaces for children. Most of the occupants are coloured, many are on welfare, but for America, there's very little crime. Why? Newman cites this fencing as one simple reason. You know you'll be observed if you wander into this project. You enter the courts through arches which are lit at night and you're immediately visible to anyone looking from any window inside the yard. Everyone knows everyone else by sight, so intruders are quickly spotted and reported. All the houses are small, one-story flats facing onto open corridors, the courtyard or the street. It may not look your ideal home, but it does exemplify certain principles which Newman calls defensible space. Even the flats facing onto the street have a symbolic dividing line between public pavement and private entrance. Then there are the steps, protected by a wall, and finally the front door. Although it's close to the street, it's somewhere you'd feel uncomfortable if you were up to no good. The wall beside the front door serves to physically identify the semi-private threshold to each home from the more public territory of the yard or street. Another simple but important element of defensible space is that the entrance to every flat is overlooked by neighbours, providing a constant unpaid security check. All the comings and goings of both residents and strangers are easily seen from other flats. It may sound a bit lacking in privacy, but there's a long waiting list of people wanting to move here because of the friendly, safe atmosphere it's achieved. There's virtually no vandalism and, apart from the occasional burglary, almost no serious crime. But most significant of all, more people are housed here per acre than in the high-rise pruitt Igo blocks which are being blown up in St. Louis. With land at a premium in cities, the number of people and homes you can pack into a given acreage is of vital importance. Every family from those streets could fit into this tower block, saving ground space, but creating the problems we've seen. Move them to a low-rise block of apartments like North Beach, and you've still got what architects call high-density housing, and not all the extra space is wasted on tarmac for cars to occasionally use. There are two housing projects in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Uh, it happens to be one of the higher crime areas in the city of New York. Uh, but they're both uh, designed at the same density. They house 288 people per acre, both of them. Um, both house equal populations in the sense of uh, same social characteristics, uh, family sizes, income group, are virtually identical, uh, same backgrounds. The high-rise are called Van Dyke, the walk-ups Brownsville, and both house the same number of people per acre. But in general crime, Van Dyke has a much worse record than Brownsville, with nearly four times as many robberies committed per year in the high-rise blocks. Like pruitt Igo, the Van Dyke project was built high to leave as much open space as possible. On the left is Brownsville, a series of low-rise walk-up blocks. Because they're next to one another and house the same sort of people, often large families deserted by fathers and supported by mothers on welfare, they're a unique opportunity to see how the same people react to different environments. The wide communal grounds in Van Dyke are little used even during the day, and at night it's a dangerous place to walk. To get from the street to an entrance, you have to walk through grounds where muggings are frequent because no one can see you. Mothers won't let young children down to these areas and they've become a wilderness roamed by teenage gangs. The graffiti and barricaded windows speak for themselves. This is the bottom of the lift shaft. The lifts are often broken and the authorities bricked in the windows on the fire stairs as they were always being smashed. 
The lights on the stairs were all broken long ago, making them dark and very dangerous. Mothers and children are often robbed of handbags and wallets as they climb these stairs after going out shopping. The only real sanctuary people have is the interior of their apartments. Behind bolted doors, many residents are very house proud and often put on a brave display of seeming affluence. But most would sell the lot for a chance to move somewhere better, where every venture outside isn't clouded by fear. To improve the public grounds, the housing authority invested thousands of pounds in play equipment. The older children use it occasionally, but even the expensive new climbing frames and slides still rarely tempt mothers to let their youngsters down away from the relative security of their apartments. From the windows of Van Dyke, you can look down across the street to the Brownsville housing project. It's a few years older than Van Dyke, and a quick glance reveals it was never a masterpiece of modern architecture. But residents seem to like it. They plant flowers in communal areas, and no one rips them out. By the entrances, they set up picnic areas, and the fragile lamps they hang above it don't ever seem to get broken. Inside, the residents have decorated the public stairs with their own wallpaper and pictures. Nobody asked them to do it, but by extending this house proudness into the semi-public areas of the project, it all becomes that much less impersonal more private, less comfortable for intruders. They've been given no expensive public play equipment, but the kids seem to make do very happily. The interesting thing was to find out why two socially identical communities behaved so differently in these two environments. Newman and his research team soon found that it was by no means as simple as saying high-rise is bad, low-rise good. Public entrance lobbies were found less inviting to intruders if they could be easily seen into from the street by people or cars passing by. Equally important, occupants need to see who's going in and out of the main entrance and to be able to watch the behavior of people in the public space immediately surrounding the block. Both are vital factors contributing to Newman's defensible space. At Brownsville, even the stairs overlook the entrance, enabling not only those inside to see who's arriving, but those outside to see who may be waiting for them on the landings inside. Now, we did an interesting experiment. Uh, we took a tape recorder, uh, and we recorded a man and woman arguing. And we, the argument got successively louder, successively, or appeared to be more violent. And we took this tape recorder, and we played it in the corridors in Brownsville and in the corridors in Van Dyke. Well, in Brownsville, it was very hard to even sneak into the building with the tape recorder without being spotted and questioned by the residents. Uh, but the moment you start playing it, people came to the door to find out what was going on. It's because the children are playing there. Many of the doors in Brownsville are kept ajar, kept open, so that people can monitor all the noise and activity in the corridors. In Van Dyke, the doors are kept locked. When we played the tape recorder and we stationed people next to each door to see their reaction, we found that as the argument on the tape recording got louder, people bolted their door. As it got louder still, they threw the second lock. And if it got very loud, some of the people would turn on a television set to drown out the noise. The statistics everywhere in this country showed that the larger the number of families that share a particular entry, a particular building, the higher will be the crime rate within it. It becomes a much more anonymous type of environment. Here one can see how the number of robberies committed per thousand families in New York goes up horrifyingly as buildings get bigger and contain more floors. But not all tower blocks are equally bad. This one actually looks down over the Van Dyke project, but it doesn't contain the usual social mix where children, young mothers, the middle-aged and the old are all lumped together. Its apartments are solely for the elderly, and there's hardly any crime at all. When the elderly are put in environments, particularly high-rise, dangerous environments, uh, and mixed in with families with children, the crime rate against them will go from three to five times the average. Uh, depending on certain types of mixes and conditions. 
But if the elderly are put in high-rise buildings, which they have exclusively to themselves, the crime rate can be virtually reduced to zero. So well, well protected. How can one man come in here and compete with maybe 12 or 15 old ladies? They'd kill him. That lady lives here, a building exclusively for the old. Intruders don't venture in, they're too easily spotted, and with no teenagers wrecking the lifts, it's a haven of peace. But apart from limiting the occupation of tower blocks exclusively to the elderly, how else can we improve the high-rise we've already got? This attempt at a solution was to pile two-storey houses, one on top of the other, giving each some defensible space with a walled patio in front. This is the view from a similar building opposite, enabling residents to look across and make neighbourly checks on who's doing what. As additional security, residents were given keys to the entrance of the project. It's a much praised design, but even here, the problem of seeing what the children are up to hasn't really been solved. On another project, they've tried a very different and some consider highly alarming new approach. be used to entry phones but here as a double check the unsuspecting caller is also monitored by a television camera linked again to sets in every apartment you can even check on television that nothing happens to your guest in the lift a favorite spot for muggings for they've put a camera there too we've also taken the central grounds of Bronxdale which were a long continuous walk which had a history of many crimes that have occurred there. We've set up television cameras on the buildings, looking down on this walk to provide a continuous image of what takes place there. And the tenant patrols sitting essentially at a TV panel with four monitors can watch what goes on on these public grounds and uh, can actually direct his cameras, panning, tilting, and zooming in. Now, I suppose with all this television surveillance, you begin to get the image that we've recreated in 1984, or rather created it for the first time. And it certainly sounds very much like that. Uh, originally, when we proposed the idea, we thought the tenants would be up in arms. And uh, in interviews, we found much to our surprise that they wanted surveillance of areas by uh, not tenant patrols or tenants in their own apartments, but rather by housing authority police. They were that frightened. Uh, we didn't uh, allow that, but it was our decision, not theirs. But high-rise blocks of flats aren't the only form of housing particularly vulnerable to crime. Ironically, this project is called Marion Gardens, but the one thing you'll not see is a garden. It's just a vast expanse of concrete strewn with anonymous drab buildings. There are neither slow lifts nor long corridors to invite trouble, but police regard it as a high crime area as there's no defensible space. You can drive a car through it in 18 different directions. Cars and children vie for open space and the right to use the grounds. Now, this may be a walk-up project, but because of the total lack of definition of space, because all the grounds are public, because in, in effect, even in a walk-up, a person's private space stops at his apartment, this area is overrun. It's filthy, it's run down. People work hard at maintaining their own apartments, but simply cannot identify with any of the space outside. It's not theirs in any sense at all. 
Projects like this would seem to defy attempts at improvement, but in this very similar depressed area, that's just what Oscar Newman and his team have succeeded in doing. We were able to test many of our ideas in a project in the Bronx, New York. We had a unique opportunity there of taking an existing project that was badly designed, badly laid out in the first instance, and then going in with a sizable sum of money and modifying the, the grounds, changing the layout of everything, and in essence producing a totally different environment, and by testing before and after with the same population, uh, we were able to see whether in fact the physical modifications, whether physical design changes really had the effect that we predicted it would. To get over the drab look of Classen Point, they offered residents a selection of coloured stucco to brighten up each house. To look more like nearby middle-income homes, each house was decorated with a mock brick finish to disguise the cinder blocks beneath and fake stone lintels were painted above the windows. New front doors were painted to each tenant's choice. The transformation was remarkable. Grey uniformity was replaced by warm colour, but perhaps more important was the provision of defensible space by redistributing the previously public ground and giving most of it back to the tenants in the form of a small patch front and rear for each house. It wasn't long before residents took pleasure and pride in their new territory and they quickly supplemented new fencing provided by the authority with their own to mark and protect it. This city slum began to look more like a country village. We were able to change the image. Now this is simply window dressing. There's no question about that. Uh, but it's window dressing, I think, with some skill in the sense that what we were trying to do was capture the image of the surrounding community. So that class and point, instead of standing out and being readily identified, stigmatized, if you will, was now virtually impossible to distinguish from the surrounding middle-income community. Planners had despaired of the depressed squalor of this area, but now residents were actively improving it themselves, buying their own paints and taking a personal interest in the look of the outside of their houses. They seeded the bare ground, growing lawns and flower beds. There's hot competition over who has the best garden. The authority provided play areas and they're intensively used. Sitting out relaxed like this was unheard of only three years ago, yet now the project has become the kind of environment where many other New Yorkers would dearly like to move to, to bring up their children. Surprisingly, however, some residents don't appreciate the change. Like I said, there's gangs around here. Uh, it's, it hasn't really changed. Modifications haven't changed a bit. Supposed to, but it didn't change at all. Why not? Why not? Because there's, there's still the same people living here, and just you know, putting the outside on a building isn't going to change the people that live here, you know, completely. Maybe people might like you know the way it looks better, or something like that, but they're not. It's not going to change the person or what you know, the people, the people that were having a crime. Fortunately, the carefully researched facts tell a very different story about the real effect the modifications have had on the people here. Oscar Newman again. The most radical difference is the crime rate. Crimes are down in the second uh, year of modifications to one-tenth of what they were three years ago. Uh, and this is parallel to to a condition in which crimes have been increasing in the surrounding community by about 25 to 30 percent. Uh, and what has happened is that the residents not only have begun to take care of the grounds that were assigned to them, they've begun to watch the paths. They've begun to extend their new felt territorial feelings to encompass the entire project. The new paths that are well lit and seated, seating provided there, have become play areas and gathering spaces for residents. And now the residents are concerned about the safety and activity that take place on the previous public grounds of the project. Well, they used to steal things and run right through. Now they have to watch themselves because these gates are closed. You know, there's only one place that they could run, it's, and that's in the front part. But before, they used to run hide and, you know, go through the back way every which way. Now there's only one way that they could run. Otherwise, they have to climb over the fence. And you'd think that it was this fencing that contributed most strongly 
But there, there really is an, another type of barrier which I happen to think is, is just as important, and it's this curbing here. Prior to the installation of the curbing, the sidewalk continued and the public space continued and went right up to the dwelling. It was possible, in fact, you could feel comfortable uh, walking from the sidewalk up to the building. It was one continuous public space. But this curb now says in a very clear and unmistakable way that frankly, this is where the public sidewalk ends and the private dwelling begins here. This is now semi-private space. The moment you step onto here above, the above and over the curb, you simply don't belong here. And walking into the grass and walking up to the window clearly defines you as an intruder. This space is semi-private. That window is the beginning of the private dwelling. The private dwelling has been extended up to the public sidewalk. It's a relief to learn Professor Newman doesn't think every single post-war housing project needs modification. San Francisco seems to do better than most American cities, and these children are playing in the precincts of one of the best developments Newman has found. It's called St. Francis Square. Like many old English squares, the entrances are on the street while the backs face a semi-private area. They may look like three-storey private houses, but in reality they're flats, each with its large balcony or small garden, six families sharing keys to each entrance. With 35 families to the acre, it's very dense housing, denser than many 10-storey blocks. But here, by clever, compact design, the architect has not only achieved a real sense of space, but given residents a friendly living environment which they feel proud of. Kids aren't too restricted in where they play or ride bikes. The community is small enough for parents to know one another and discuss problems and complaints. But more significant in America is the fact that although a resident teenager here can loaf around at leisure, any suspicious stranger would be spotted instantly. Again, it's defensible space. Both old and young use the communal facilities to the full. There's space for everyone to play or just sit in the sun. This is a similar project in South London called Pollard's Hill. Here the housing is made up of maisonettes and flats, all backing onto small gardens and a shared square of grass lawn. Surprisingly, there are more people housed here than in many high-rises. For all its appearance of low density, Pollard's Hill actually houses 115 families to the acre. Uh, it does much more than that. It gives virtually every family its own garden its own entrance in the front and parking area, and it goes one appreciable step further beyond the tradition of the English row house. It creates a series of closes, contained areas like this, contained on all sides by buildings that belong to a particular group, grouping of families, and this is the collective play space. These tiny backyards may not be your concept of utopia, but they're a happy alternative to families used to living 15 stories up. Unfortunately, as Professor Newman points out, this project has turned its back on the car. An English tendency, he says, is to banish the car to the back of buildings where it takes up valuable space. Many might disagree, but he thinks we've overreacted to the dangers of traffic and by trying to keep people and cars completely separate, we've dehumanized our streets, creating greater dangers for ourselves on lonely pavements. Who really can feel they're coming home if they have to get there through this maze of concrete? So far, this is a much improved area, but for how long? There's graffiti here, lots of it. Current British housing policy is against tower blocks, but building contracts for many high-rise blocks were signed 10, even 15 years ago. The Aylesbury estate we saw in Southwark still isn't finished. It will be, and so will many others. Plans have been passed, and building goes on. The real problem with the architectural profession is that it has let us all down. Architects have been entrusted with a certain responsibility by people, and in fact, they've bombed out. They've taken 
the faith we have in their ability to understand our needs and translate them into buildings. And they've gone ahead and gone along their own course. In the end, they are not concerned with the needs of people and don't, in their buildings, answer them. They answer their own needs. They are more concerned in the design of projects and buildings with producing something that's going to win them a design award and receive the applause of other architects. The applause for Pruitt Igo has died. It's being knocked down because it's unworkable. By comparison, no product of British architecture has so far proved such a disastrous white elephant. Policy has at least pushed high-rise off the drawing board, if not the building site. Low-rise has now become trendy, but as we've seen, it too can pose problems. Professor Newman points out that architects have a wide range of options. Where high density is essential, the solution doesn't have to be high or low-rise, but a mixture. High-rise for the elderly, for childless couples, low-rise for families with children, and, most important of all, buildings designed with defensible space to make people feel safe and secure, homes they can be proud of. In America, an environment, a project like this, would produce a very high crime rate sufficiently high in fact so that in a short period of a few years the environment would have to be closed down. We'd have to close it down and possibly even tear it down as we've begun to do to some of our more notorious projects. Crime is not a situation here as it is in America. But one wonders, there are children growing up here. This is the first generation that have lived in projects like this. Well, we've had our generation grow up in them. One wonders, what happens to the children who grow up here? Do they ever really develop any sense of pride, any sense of self, any understanding of responsibility in an environment that is so open and undefined? Can they ever really develop a sense of their own rights and corresponding sense of the rights of others? It's very difficult to believe that children who grow up here will grow up feeling any sense of responsibility, any sense of a role in society, any sense of a contribution they can make. There is no evidence as yet that this type of environment produces criminals. We know that it facilitates the commission of crime for the simple reason that it's so easy to get away with. What we find here in England is a lot of attending vandalism but not the crime rates we have in America. But one wonders, will these children grow up to become the criminals that we seem to have so much uh, of in America in such abundance?